welcome to class 7 on topics in power electronics and distributed generation. In the last class, we were looking at uh, symmetrical components uh, uh, techniques and uh, looking at models of uh, uh, the line, transformer, etcetera. Today, we will continue with the transformer model. We will look at uh, the phase relationship between the windings of the transformer. And if you look at a typical uh, three phase transformer, you can have uh, y y delta y delta delta variety of combin four combinations. And a typical assumption is that uh, y y and uh, delta delta is uh, at uh, 0 degree phase shift. So, So, typically these are considered 0 degree phase shift, but by uh, selecting the, the dot points and the appropriate uh, changing interchanging the terminals of the transformer, it is possible to get uh, uh, 180 degree shifts, uh, uh, 60, 120 degree shifts etcetera depending on how the, the actual terminals are labeled. If you look at uh, uh, a delta y or a y delta transformer, uh, again you would typically expect them to have phase shifts of uh, 30 degrees. Uh, we will see that it is possible to get uh, uh, 30 degrees, 90, 150 degrees etcetera depending again on the sense of the winding and how the windings are connected. We will do this through a couple of examples. Okay. So, if you look at uh, 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 a delta y uh, transformer which is shown, shown in this figure. Uh, so, uh, so, your primary is connected in delta and if you look at uh, uh, the windings say winding 1 uh, is uh, is connected uh, between phase uh, A and C, winding 2 is uh, between B and A and winding 3 uh, between uh, B and uh, C and B. And then you look at the corresponding uh, windings on the secondary, you will see that uh, uh, you will see that uh, 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 phase A on the secondary is uh, in phase with winding 1. So, this is winding 1 on the secondary. Similarly, you would have this is winding uh, 2 on the secondary and this is winding 3 on the secondary. So, you have uh, V A C on the primary side in phase with V A on your secondary. And you have now if you look at the line to line voltage on the secondary, you take V A minus V C to be V A C and you can see that your delta leads your y by 30 degrees. Okay. So, if you now look at the second case over here where you have a change in uh, the dot points and uh, the way the windings are connected, you have now windings 1, 2 and 3 uh, connected on the delta side as in the previous case and the corresponding windings on the secondary is winding 1, winding 2 and winding 3 and the dot points are brought in. So, if you look at V A C on the primary now that is now having a uh, going to the secondary winding on C uh, and you can cal uh, look at what V A, V B and V C would be in this particular case. And you can see now if you plot V A C, it is V A minus V C. Now, your delta is uh, lagging your y by 30 degrees. So, you can have a delta y transformer depending on your winding configuration, you can have plus 30, minus 30, uh, 
plus 90 minus 90 uh, uh, and now if you look at both the y y delta y transformers it is possible to have every 30 degree point on your clock uh, can be obtained with the winding connections on, on your transformer. Okay. in this particular case and then to uh, get the actual phase shifts you can uh, the straightforward way to do it would be to actually look at the waveforms on your transformer to see what your actual phase shifts are or you have to go in take a look at uh, your dot points the sense of the windings and how it is connected in the uh, physical transformer to find out what the expected uh, uh, phase uh, uh, relationship between your primary and secondary is going to be. Okay. So, uh, you cannot just say this is going to be just 30 degrees uh, lag all the time, you have to actually look at what exactly is the physical device that you are handling. Okay. So, if you look at then uh, the, uh, the next component which would be a uh, 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 machine, you can have a uh, synchronous machine and if you want to look at its sequence components, then you have to ask in what time frame are you looking at the sequence components of the machine. And you, if you are doing it for fault analysis and your fault time durations of the or, are of the order of uh, a few cycles uh, um, say 10 to 100 milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds, then you are looking at the sub uh, the transient time constant of the uh, synchronous machine. So, so for the analysis you can uh, then look at what your positive sequence, negative sequence and zero sequence models would be and your positive sequence model is that of your uh, voltage uh, induced voltage which is your uh, EMF which would be close to 1 per unit and then your uh, uh, transient impedance uh, which uh, would be your uh, value for your z plus. If you look at your uh, negative sequence model of the of the machine, uh, then you have uh, no back EMF because the induced voltage is positive sequence. Your impedance again is your transient time constant z minus. If you look at the zero sequence, it would be the zero sequence of the machine. This is for a machine where you connect to the neutral point assuming that you need to feed a, a four wire system in which case you have a z naught as your zero sequence impedance. And if you physically connect a, a impedance to the neutral, then you would have z naught plus 3 times z n would be your effective zero sequence model for the machine along with the neutral impedance. So, with uh, these models uh, we can now look at uh, what would happen when you have a unbalanced uh, uh, fault in a system. Okay. So, to analyze an uh, uh, unbalanced uh, situation such as a single line to ground fault, uh, essentially you need to identify uh, the source, the, the line on which the fault is occurring and maybe if the load is significant, maybe you can have models for the load also. And uh, your source, uh, your line, the loads can be represented uh, with the sequence models and we will assume again without loss of generality that your fault is happening on phase A, it can happen on any phase, but for analysis without loss of generality you can assume it is phase A. So, if you have a fault with fault impedance Z f, uh, you have a voltage on your phase A uh, which is equal to V f and you have no, no fault and you have a corresponding fault current I f flowing through the fault and you have no fault currents in phase B and phase C because they are not connected 
to the point to the ground at which the fault is occurring. So, you can actually model this line by three current sources I f a and I f b and your I f a is equal to your actual fault current and your I f b is equal to 0 and your I f c is equal to 0 and replacing your uh, fault impedance with these current sources will not change the circuit in any way because your current that you are actually extracting is exactly the same as what you had with your fault impedance. So, at the point of fault you have V A is equal to V F is equal to I F Z F. So, you can now write your sequence components of your voltage and, uh, and current at the fault. So, you have you have V A and we know our uh, V f is equal to V a and is equal to now if you take the first row of this uh, matrix multiplication you get uh, V 0 plus V plus plus V minus. And if you look at your corresponding uh, uh, currents you can write your your fault currents i f 0 i f plus i f minus as one third I f is the fault current which is happening on phase A, phase B and phase C has 0 cu current at the fault. So, if you look at your fault current uh, in terms of the sequence components, you have I f 0 is equal to I f plus is equal to I f minus and this is equal to I f by 3. So, if you so essentially now if you look at the constraints that you have, you have your four your V f to be equal to V 0 plus V plus plus V minus and the magnitude of the currents flowing through these sequence component models are equal, then essentially what it reflects is a circuit that is connected in series where the total voltage is the sum of the individual voltages and the value of currents going through is the same. So, you have components that are connected in, in, uh, in series. So, if you look at the model of what would be the equivalent uh, sequence model to analyze this particular fault, you would have the three components connected in series. So, if you look at uh, what goes into each of these blocks you have the positive sequence part of your uh, circuit put into one particular part of the model, then you have the negative sequence part, then you have the 0 sequence part, uh, they are all connected in series. So, your I f plus, I f minus and I f 0 they are equal and which is in turn is equal to I f by 3. 
and if you look at the total voltage across the three components that is equal to your V f which also happens to be your V a at the point at which the fault is occurring. And similar to what we have done over here for single line to ground fault, you can actually uh, create uh, models for to analyze uh, other varieties of faults such as line to line fault, uh, line to line to ground fault, uh, open conductor faults and uh, uh, this type of analysis would be there in a power systems textbook. So, we will we'll not go into the detail, we will just look at a, a particular example, a common uh, case of fault is a single line to ground fault. So, with this we will look at an example where we have uh, 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 synchronous machine uh, feeding uh, a particular line and you have a circuit breaker which uh, you want to protect the line or the loads connected to the line and you have a fault on this line and you want to look at what your three phase uh, fault current would be and what your single line to ground fault current would be and then determine uh, if you connect uh, what would be the value of neutral current uh, neutral uh, reactance that you may want to connect to make sure that bo both the current levels stay similar. So, in this model we will take uh, say this is a synchronous machine this might be a round rotor machine a non salient pole machine. So, we will take x s to be say 110 percent your transient uh, uh, re uh, reactance to be 30 percent and your 0 sequence uh, reactance to be 10 percent. So, if you now look at uh, what the model would be for uh, a three phase fault uh, on that particular machine. The circuit model would be quite straightforward 1 per unit your uh, reactance that limits the current is J.3 and you are considering a solid fault and the resulting current is your I f and you can get your magnitude of I f So, you would expect a fault current of the order of 3.3 per unit uh, to flow when you have a solid three phase fault on the terminal uh, at the output of the machine. So, now the question is what happens when you have a single line to ground fault. So, for the single line to ground fault you take your sequence components and assemble the network in series. So, your negative sequence model is just uh, uh, the impedance your zero sequence model so you get uh, i f by 3. and you can calculate I f magnitude to be 4.3 per unit. So, you can see that your uh, single phase fault now results in higher fault current than your three phase fault. So, next you could ask uh, what would be the value of uh, uh, a, a reactance that, that you would connect to the to the uh, neutral of the machine uh, 
to make sure that your fault current stays uh, similar to the uh, three phase fault. So, if you connect a neutral uh, 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 impedance essentially what you would have is your I f by 3 you want uh, to be uh, 3.3 per unit divided by 3. and you can calculate your Zn to be about uh, 7.7 to be about 7 percent. So, if you had a added a 7 percent reactance to the neutral, then your uh, single line to ground fault current level would be similar to that of the three phase fault current level. So, now that we have seen uh, how to calculate uh, faults under a uh, different fault conditions including unbalance, then we can ask the question what does it mean to protect uh, some component. So, the we will look at the simplest case where you are protecting a uh, uh, conductor a piece of wire. Okay. So, if you want So, if you want to uh, protect a piece of wire, it means that if you have fault, you cause uh, energy dissipation in the conductor and, uh, uh, and you want to ensure that the energy dissipation does not cause damage either to the wire or to the insulation of the wire. right? can be damaged to insulation or to connectors where or the mounting points. So, whatever is uh, required to ensure that the wire is in place, uh, those, those things also need to be uh, factored in when you are looking at uh, conductor protection. So, we will uh, we'll take a look at a wire. Uh, so, if you have a wire of a given uh, wire gauge, we know it is uh, called cross sectional area. So, uh, if it is A in say meter square and the length of the wire is L in meters and the resistivity of the conductor is rho in ohm meter and the density of the conductor is say D. So, this is k g per meter cubed. And we will assume that uh, specific heat capacity of the conductor is uh, C 
and this is in joules per kg uh, per degree centigrade. Uh, so, you are talking of temperature rise. So, centigrade and Kelvin is uh, equivalent and uh, we will also assume the fault current level. Here is I f. So, the fault current level is determined by your upstream impedance and your voltage behind it and your fault duration is uh, uh, T f in seconds and this is determined by your protective device which is which has to clear the fault. Okay. So, if you look at then the uh, the resistance of the conductor, you know the resistance of the conductor is rho L by A is the value of the resistance in ohms and the energy dissipated during the fault uh, is uh, I square R is the power dissipated and I square R for a duration of T gives the energy in joules. So, E f is the energy dissipated in joules. Okay. So, if you have a conductor of weight, we will assume that uh, uh, the area of the wire is A, the length is L uh, and D is the density. So, D A L is the weight of the wire. You can assume maybe it is some cylindrical uh, tube or so you could make some assumptions and look at what the uh, weight of the wire is and you get the weight. Then you can calculate the temperature rise as uh, uh, the maximum temperature would be your nominal temperature at, it at which it was operating before you had the fault plus your energy uh, that is deposited during the fault divided by the weight into its specific heat capacity. Okay. So, if you now write down the values of this particular uh, 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 components essentially what you would get is a relationship between uh, your what your uh, maximum temperature is and your parameters of the circuit. You could assume that uh, say for example, for a copper conductor uh, copper melts at, uh, at uh, about 1080 degrees. Okay. But you do not have to wait till it melts. Uh, you can have cough, uh, copper softening. So, if you are having it under compression in some crimping crimped circuit, you might get, see softening at around 400 degrees centigrade beyond which you can have mechanical deformations etcetera. If you look at the insulation, your PVC insulation will start getting damaged at uh, 160 degrees centigrade and if you look at uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, insulation such as uh, XLP or cross linked polyethylene you are talking about maybe 250 uh, degrees C. So, you are talking so you get a feel for what the temperature can go up to and now you can write your maximum temperature as now I square uh, T f times resistance divided by the weight into specific he, uh, heat capacity. So, you can bring out your I square T f and you will get a relationship be between I square T f for the conductor and the maximum temperature that you uh, are allowing for the conductor times the density specific heat capacity divided by the resistivity times your cross sectional area square. Okay. So, you can think of it as some k square a square is essentially the, uh, the I square t beyond which the particular uh, piece of uh, wire uh, particular conductor will get damaged. And uh, 
essentially what this means is that uh, if you have a protective device which is protecting this particular conductor, its I square t has to be less than the value of the I square t at which you are causing damage to the wire. Okay. So, so the protective device should have a lower value of I square t compared to the, the value that you have for your conductor. The second thing is uh, if you look at uh, if you want say uh, to look at what else you could do if for a piece of wire if you double the area of cross section essentially its ability to withstand a fault is uh, getting enhanced by a factor of 4. Okay. So, you take a, a wire which is uh, twice as thick it can endure 4 times the I square t as the wire of half the cross sectional area. So, with that uh, we also need to keep in mind the assumptions that you have. So, we are assuming in this particular case all the heat that is deposited in is going into raising the temperature. So, we are neglecting all cooling effects. So, given the short time duration over which this is happening that may be reasonably true, but if your fault is occurring for much larger time duration you may have to give factors for uh, your cooling effects uh, might uh, change the T max. Okay. It also ignores that the parameters that you typically take for resistivity uh, etcetera is uh, temperature dependent. So, if you take a fixed parameter then obviously, you are going to have an error. So, this gives you a, a, an idea of what the value could be your actual uh, I square t can have uh, uh, need additional factors to be considered to look at what exactly would be the point at which uh, uh, your wire can get damaged because you know that obviously at uh, higher temperatures the resistance would increase essentially reflecting in the resistivity being a function of temperature. Okay. So, similar to what you have done for the wire you could actually do similar analysis for other types of uh, components such as windings, coils in transformers, machines etcetera to look at what would be the level at which you uh, can cause damage to the conductor. Okay. So, the other thing that you could uh, look at is what would be the typical parameters say if you are considering uh, different types of materials if you look at uh, say copper. Uh, so, you have copper's resistivity is uh, 1.7 into 10 to the power of minus 8 ohm meter, its density is 8.9 into 10 to the power of 3 kg per meter cubed, its specific heat capacity is uh, 0 0.4 into 10 to the power of 3 joules per kg per degree centigrade. If you look at uh, for aluminum, say you have aluminum conductors rather than copper conductors, you have uh, 2.82 into 10 to the power of minus 8 ohm meter. Uh, for density it is 2.9 into 10 to the power of 3. So, the resistivity of aluminum is not as good as that of copper, its density is uh, having a smaller value because it is a lot lighter. Its specific heat capacity is uh, 0.9 per degree centigrade. So, you could get a feel for what uh, uh, would be the resulting properties if you have uh, these uh, different types of conductors. So, we will look at an example to look at uh, uh, a piece of uh, say wire, uh, 12 gauge wire and see what it takes to protect it. Okay. So, 
if you look at the ampacity of the wire, it is roughly 20, 25 amps if you look at the wire tables. So, uh, so you should be able to carry the, uh, that level of current and uh, if you look at again the wire tables would give its cross sectional area, cross sectional area of the wire is 3.4 mm square, uh, its diameter is 2.1 mm corresponding to 12 wire gauge. We will consider a unit section uh, as you saw in the formula previously the length gets cancelled out in the I square T uh, expression, we will consider a unit length of wire. Okay. So, if you look at uh, the resistance of the conductor, this is now 5 milli ohms per meter would be the resistance uh, on a per unit length basis and its volume again for a unit length is uh, uh, 0 0.3. Uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, it is volume per uh, uh, into 100 uh, cm cubed, okay. 100 centimeters in 1 meter. So, that gives you its volume and then you can use that to calculate the weight is uh, it turns out to be about 3 grams per meter. If you look at the uh, the specific heat, this turns out to be 0 0.4 joules per gram per degree centigrade. And if you look at the fault current level, the fault current level is limited by the upstream impedance. to 500 amps. So, it is uh, about 20 times its ampacity. So, during a fault you get a high current flowing through the circuit and uh, then you can calculate uh, say you have a circuit breaker which uh, now clears it on a nearly instantaneous basis. So, we will assume that your uh, T uh, f the fault duration is uh, 5 cycles or 100 milliseconds. So, next you can calculate what, what is the energy uh, uh, dissipated during the fault duration. So, your E f I square r into your fault duration. So, this is about 125 joules uh, per unit length of the wire and uh, if you look at then your corresponding temperature rise, your delta T is the energy dissipated divided by your weight into specific heat capacity. So, that turns out to be about 105 uh, degree centigrade. Okay. So, if you are using a conductor where with uh, PVC type of insulation and your ambient was under nominal conditions, your uh, your wire was operating at close to 50 degrees centigrade in your cabinet, then during fault if you have a rise of 105, it is getting close to the point where it 
is damaging the insulation. So, you could consider a few options at this point. One option is uh, maybe you could look at uh, a protective device which can operate in a quicker ma manner, maybe 3 cycles rather than 5 cycles. Uh, many times uh, you do not want to design your own special uh, uh, circuit breaker, you want to use the commercially available device. So, you might be restricted in terms of how quickly it acts. It, the commercially available device might be 5 cycles might be what its uh, instantaneous trip, level, uh, trip duration is. Uh, the other thing that you could do is uh, maybe you could see if uh, your fault current level can be reduced below 500 amps which would give you again margin in your temperature. Again it may not be possible to increase your uh, temperature under uh, I mean your source impedance because it may not be directly under your control. So, your first option was to see if uh, T f can be reduced. The second was uh, whether I f magnitude can be reduced. The other thing that you could do which might be more directly under control is maybe instead of a 12 gauge wire you use a thicker wire you might choose a 10 gauge wire okay? because you saw that your i square t goes as a square. Now, using the thicker wire will reduce the temperature to which it would go during the fault duration. So, some of the things that you can see from this example is uh, the the, the fault withstand capability of the wire, uh, you the parameter k that you saw uh, in the expression over here depends on a uh, number of uh, factors. It depends on the material whether it is uh, whether it is copper, aluminum or some other alloy. Uh, it depends on your insulation. Whether it is PVC or XLP or whether it is varnish or whether it is exposed conductor sitting on a ceramic. Uh, so, you will have to look at uh, the surrounding materials, you will have to look at the configuration, whether this cable is sitting within a sheath or whether it, there are multiple conductors, whether there is reinforcement within the cable. So, uh, you will have to look at these factors to actually determine what is the level at which you can you need to protect the wire and then select the appropriate protective device up in a appropriate manner or change the configuration in your design of what is the conductor that you would be using. So, with this background now we will look at uh, what it means to actually do coordination in on a distribution system. Uh, so, we will look at the example where say you have couple of circuit breakers, a upstream breaker and a downstream breaker and you want to coordinate the operation of the two breakers. So, so we will look at an example where you have a source, uh, you, uh, you have 3 buses, uh, bus 1, 2 and 3 and you have the loads at each of these buses 60 amps at bus 1, 50 amps at bus 2, 100 amps at bus 3 and you have uh, 2 circuit breakers, circuit breaker 1 protecting zone 1 and circuit breaker 2 protecting zone 2, zone 3 is whatever is downstream of bus 3. Okay. And you have uh, wiring uh, uh, that those, these wirings could be having different uh, ampacity levels. So, you need to protect them appropriately uh, which could be the reason why you have couple of breakers. And uh, then the question is what does it mean by having coordination between the two breakers circuit breaker 1 and circuit breaker 2. So, if you have a fault in zone 1 
obviously the protective device that needs to operate is circuit breaker 1 okay. And if you have a fault in zone 2, the fault has to be created by CB2. If you have a fault in zone 2, what you want to avoid is nuisance stripping of circuit breaker 1 uh, because you want to may ensure that CB2 operates before CB1 acts. Okay. For some reason if CB2 fails then essentially you want to have CB1 provide backup protection uh, to the system and by uh, if circuit breaker 2 fails they may potentially be some damage to zone 2 but you do not want damage spreading to zone 1. Okay. If uh, similarly if you now have uh, a fault in zone 3 uh, essentially it, it might have its own local protective devices, but if those protective devices fail you do not want the damage from zone 3 to actually uh, affect your zone 1. Okay. So, to do this analysis what you have to do is uh, get the dat data on what would be the ranges of fault current levels that happen uh, whether the fault is occurring close to circuit breaker 1 or further away close to circuit breaker 2 depending on your location, depending on the type of fault whether it is a, a 3 phase fault, single phase fault, uh, whether uh, you have a solid fault or some impedance in the fault. You can get a range of current levels that could occur in the circuit and you want to ensure that uh, uh, get a feel for what is the range that you are dealing with. Okay. So, we will assume that uh, uh, you have done your analysis and you have identified a range of current levels uh, uh, for, for this particular circuit. And for the circuit now you for example, at bus 1 you found that the range of fault current level is between 1000 and 1400 amps. Uh, and the load at that particular bus is 60 amps the line the nominal current that the circuit breaker would see is essentially the load from uh, down its downstream load which is essentially 50 amps plus 100 amps that would be its nom nominal current. So, you put up a factor of safety uh, 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 of 1.5 and say your pickup current level for your circuit breaker 1 is 225 amps. Uh, similarly, for circuit breaker 2 you find that the you do your analysis and find the range of fault current levels. So, we have indicated that the fault current level is going to be between 600 and 1000 amps. The, the load at bus 2 is 50 amps and the breaker itself will see a nominal current level of 100 amps. So, we will take a factor of 1.5 and take its pickup current level as 150 amps. And the, the downstream fault downstream of uh, bus 3 in zone 3 uh, has a range of current levels between 450 and 600 amps. Okay. So, with this the question is uh, how do we uh, do coordination of these uh, breakers. We will also make an assumption on the on the protective devices that are used. So, we will use uh, your circuit breakers with definite time delay of 2 cycles of 40 milliseconds. And, uh, and extremely inverse characteristics we will assume that uh, reset time is 30 seconds for both the breakers and we will assume that uh, the I square T
in zone 1 is 2 in the 10 power of 6 ampere square second and for zone 2 is 2. So, the, so, next we can calculate what your uh, uh, your a value for the circuit breakers would be and we saw uh, we in a uh, couple of classes back we saw the relationship between your a and your uh, circuit breaker uh, uh, pickup current and your i square t for extremely inverse characteristics we have a uh, for c b 1 which is uh, roughly given as uh, i square t divided by i square pickup because a by m square would be your uh, trip time. So, assuming taking your m to be i by i pickup you get this particular relationship. So, your a of your circuit breaker should now be less than 39.5 seconds for circuit breaker 1 and a for circuit breaker 2 is given should be less than 44. 0.4 seconds. Uh, you know the I pickup value for the each section, each zone, and you, sh you should be able to calculate uh, your value of A. So, now you have your parameters for your circuit breaker. We will take circuit breaker 1, P is 2, uh, B is 0 0.04 seconds, and your A will take a value less than. 39 will take a is 30 30 seconds and for circuit breaker 2 p is 2 because of its extremely inverse characteristics b is 2 cycles and will take a to be 35 and we'll see with these parameters whether you could uh, uh, achieve coordination at the range of current levels that were uh, indicated in the data that you got from your analysis of fault current levels. We will we'll do that in the next class. Mm -hmm.